So hi, everyone, and welcome back to our discussion on uh, financial decision-making under certainty. And in this video, we're going to discuss how we sort of uh, represent consumer preferences in the context of financial economics in the most basic uh, sort, of, uh, sort of terrain. So there are a couple of ways to represent consumer preferences. And those preferences, as we've said in the past video, have to, um, have to adhere to certain actions. So these are the actions of completeness, transitivity, uh, non-sachation, non and strict convexity. So consumer behavior must adhere to those assumptions that we've had. And essentially, we need to find a way on how we're going to sort of mathematically uh, represent uh, the ranking that we could potentially get from uh, uh, from these preferences, such that we can model them and make informed uh, decisions and inferences about how consumers behave. So there are a couple of ways on how to represent consumer preferences. One is we could do a simple ranking of consumption streams. So we can ask everyone in the population to just rank their consumption preferences, and then we would have some simple ranking. But that may not be uh, the most efficient thing to do because, uh, you know, uh, interviewing everyone in the population, each having a particular bias and everything. So that may lead us to a dead end. Another one which is more conventional in economics is, of course, the concept of indifference curves. Now, we're familiar with the concept of indifference curves when we're doing things such as comparing two goods say the utility function was just a function of two goods, then we could sort of splice the utility function out and then we could get an indifference curve, which is a level set of consumption bundles representing the two goods, all having each bundle having or yielding the same amount of utility. That's one thing that we're gonna do, but instead of this uh, being two goods, it will be our consumption streams, our consumption today versus our consumption tomorrow, the trade off between consuming today and consuming the future. That's gonna be our essentially our two goods moving forward in financial economics. And of course, as, as I've said, I've just said, a utility function, of course. Uh, if the utility function, uh, if we evaluate the utility function at certain consumption bundles, and we find out that it's higher than other bundles, then we can say that this bundle has or gives us a higher level of satisfaction, at least for that consumer, than those other bundles. So uh, let's, let's begin, right? So how do we uh, sort of view this? So let's go with the utility function. So the utility function, as it is in micro, right, in typical micro, assigns an index value. Note, it is an index or an ordinal value. This is not a cardinal value. Uh, I cannot say, for example, if the utility assigned is two and another bundle is four, that the second bundle gives me twice as much happiness as the first. That, that's meaningless, right? It's only an ordinal thing. This is only for order, right? And this utility function is, uh, uh, it, it, it's a value function that ranks different consumption streams, right? And this is used to reflect the preference assumptions uh, in the past discussions on our axioms of consumer behavior, then well, what, what we can see is for any two objects of choice that is in our consumption stream, we have present and future consumption, right? So say we have two potential streams, one where there's a combination for present and future and another one with uh, a combination for present and future consumption. How will we rank the two? Well we can say that the first one will be pre preferred to the second one if and only if the utility function, if I evaluate that utility function to that, those values is greater than the utility function ranked using the other values. So that means the first bundle is preferred to the second if the utility function of the first is higher than the second. And the same is true when you're dealing with indifference, but uh, what you need to do is you need to make sure that we, we need to see that the utility function of the two bundles equal each other. So that's a simple concept of a utility function. It's nothing too far away from typical micro. So um, we're gonna get into a similar concept that we probably tackled in basic economics. And in that the utility function, right? As we said, uh, in the utility function, individuals uh, rank all possible consumption streams from the least desirable to the most desirable, right? So if you are given, say, a, a, a plethora or a, a line of bundles, say 10 bundles, 
based on the values of their, uh, if you evaluate them to a utility function, you can rank all the 10 bundles. You can say which you least prefer and which you most prefer, right? And the assumption, okay, uh, the assumption that a consumer prefers more consumption to less consumption, that's our assumption of non satiation implies that the marginal utility of every additional consumption, say you increase your present consumption, none less of the future, or you increase your future consumption, none less of the present, okay, it's always going to make you happier. You're always going to want a higher standard of living, as we've said in the past video. And this implies that the marginal utility that you obtain, uh, that is the utility you gain from consuming another unit of uh, uh, another uh, unit of uh, in, the, in the present or in the future period, none less of the other period, is going to be always positive, right? And it just means that uh, when we say that that assumption holds, it means that the marginal utility of extra present consumption gives the rate at which utility changes when we change our present consumption, none less of the future consumption, which is C1. So C1 is held fixed, and that's given by the derivative if we take the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to C0. And we denote that as U0, or the marginal utility of present consumption, of extra present consumption, rather. Similarly, the marginal utility of extra future consumption gives the rate at which utility changes when we change future consumption, that's C1, holding our present consumption fixed, right? That's, again, same concept. And we denote that as U1, sorry for the typo, that's U1, wherein we derive uh, the utility function with respect to C1. And that assumption is that the, the assumption is that the consumer chooses the most preferred consumption stream implies that essentially our goal is we're going to maximize the utility function. We're going to want to maximize that in terms of determining which is which one, which bundle a consumer should opt for. Now, this uh, another way to represent consumer preference in the context of financial economics is, of course, through indifference curves. Right? It's no different than in micro. And uh, as we said, preferences can be graphically represented using ICs or using indifference curves. Which we, uh, which we refer to as level sets of the utility function. So we have a 3D utility function because you have consumption today on one axis, consumption today in another axis, and the value of the, the, value of the function in others is a 3D graph. If you splice it around, hold the value of the function fixed or hold the utility fixed, right? Uh, you can get an indifference curve. And what we notice is that each level of utility, because you can splice it, right? You can splice at the value. Each level of utility is, re is represented by a particular indifference curve. And any consumption stream that lies along the same IC gives exactly the same utility, right? So that's the same as micro. So here is a graphical example. So if you notice, any point along this same uh, along this blue curve, which is our indifference curve, gives us the exact same utility. So, for example, you have a point at the uh, the far left, right, uh, which has a high consumption of C1 but a low consumption of C0, that gives you the same utility as a point to the far right, which gives you a low C1 and a high C0. So a high, a low consumption in the future, a high consumption today. So those two unique bundles. Uh, will give you, or streams rather, would give you the exact same utility for as long as they both lie on along those along the blue line that we have here in this slide. So let's get into the slope of an indifference curve. Now, the slope of, uh, of an indifference curve uh, is a key concept that we have to learn. And uh, as we said, suppose uh, the present consumption and the future consumption change simultaneously, but infinitesimally small, uh, as in we're going to do a proof using a derivative, of course, uh, the change in utility is just merely the total differential, right? And we, we want to see the change in utility du. So that's this one, this one element here, du. Now, du, okay, du, which is the change in utility, is just equal to the total differential, which is the marginal utility, so you have here the marginal utility of good uh, of your present consumption stream, and you have here the marginal utility of your other uh, consumption stream. 
So you have here uh, uh, the, the marginal utility for the future consumption stream. And what we notice is that th that makes up effectively the total differential. So you multiply the marginal utility of the present times how much you're going to change the present, which is DC naught plus the marginal utility of the future, which is U1, times how much you're gonna change the future, which is DC1. But uh, remember, when we're dealing with, uh, when we're dealing with uh, the, this differential in the context of an indifference curve, when you are along an indifference curve, there is no change in utility, right? When you're along the blue line, as we said earlier in our example, in our graphical example, all points along the blue line have exactly the same utility. So there is no change in utility along that line, right? Meaning if you take the derivative of uh, the change in future consumption with respect to the change in present consumption, holding utility constant, you get the slope of the indifference curve at a point which we denote as, uh, which is negative U naught over U1 or the marginal utility of extra present consumption divided by the marginal utility of uh, extra future consumption. Note that the slope is negative, as we said, because, and as we noticed, because the indifference curves are downward sloping, right? And that implies the slope of the IC based on this uh, derivative proof here. Now, the assumption of positive marginal utilities implies that the slope of any IC at any point is negative, right? Because U not and U1 by non-satiation are always greater than zero. And we, we notice that if, 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 uh, if we have here U naught, U naught here, this one is strictly positive, then you have here U1, which is also strictly positive, then a positive divided by a positive times a negative is definitely a negative. And essentially, that's, uh, that's our sort of uh, proof for the downward sloping indifference curve, right? Now we get into a concept called the marginal rate of substitution if we take the negative of the slope of an IC and that's given by uh, just U naught over U1 or the negative of the, neg of the slope. And in this case, you call that the marginal rate of substitution between C naught and C1. So again, let me reemphasize, this is something that uh, students typically get wrong. They think that the marginal rate of substitution is the slope of the indifference curve. That is not correct. The marginal rate of substitution is the negative of the slope of the indifference curve. So that's the slope of the indifference curve. Now, what exactly is the marginal rate of substitution in a financial economics concept? Well, the marginal rate of substitution is the negative of the slope of an indifference curve, right? As we said, and uh, MRS is generally uh, denoted, at least in our lecture, between present and future consumption. And this is the rate at which consumer, a consumer is willing to exchange future consumption for present consumption while maintaining the exact same utility. Now, what does this imply? It means that a higher MRS implies a higher degree of substitutability between future and present consumption. So, for example, I was faced with a bundle with a very, very high level of future consumption and a very, very low despairing level of present consumption, right? The consumer would easily give up this much or a lot of, uh, a lot of future consumption just to get an additional uh, current consumption because this is more valuable to him or her, right? Because uh, again, as we said, with, this is now leaning to sort of the strict convexity thing, right? And at that point, wherein the future is high, the present is slow, that's at the high MRS. As you go to closer and closer to the middle, the MRS generally declines, in which you would be less willing to substitute your current consumption and your future consumption, in which case you're, try, you're sort of uh, getting to a point of sort of equilibrium. But we'll, we'll talk about that equilibrium point or that optimal point when we start to incorporate the capital market trading line and some other things. So that's our concept of marginal rate of substitution. Now, the shape of the indifference curve is also a key concept that we're going to discuss. And the shape of an indifference curve is a strictly convex uh, level set, right? And it reflects the assumption that consumers prefer average bundles to extreme, uh, to extreme bundles, or in this case, average consumption streams 
to extreme consumption streams. They don't want the example I said earlier with such a high future and such a low present or the reverse, such a high present and such a low future. They want something generally in the middle or something that can suit their sort of needs. And along any IC, in order to maintain the standard of living, of course, the slope increases as the present consumption increases and future consumption decreases, holding utility constant. So if you notice uh, an indifference curve is shaped like that, as you go down, as you go down and uh, what happens is the future consumption will decrease, your present consumption will increase, holding utility constant because you're moving along the same indifference curve, then that, uh, that's, uh, that slope is generally decrease, uh, increasing or it could be the opposite direction. Now, we have here the derivatives to prove that. So since uh, the slope increases as present consumption increases uh, and future consumption decreases, holding utility constant, this implies that if I take the negative of this, it should be positive. And since I know that this one, the negative of this uh, function here, this is just the derivative or the change in MRS with respect to a change in present consumption. So a second order thing, this is, this is supposed to be just C naught, holding it to the constant, this will also be negative. So it means that along an, an, along an IC, the marginal rate of substitution diminishes. So you would be less willing to trade uh, your, uh, in this case, your present consumption for future consumption because future consumption is now getting more and more scarce uh, in your perspective, according to you. So, that's our uh, discussion on how to sort of view a consumer's preferences, similar to how we have it in microeconomics. But in this case, we now incorporate the concept of consumption streams. And in the next video, we're going to discuss a uh, consumer's lifetime consumption opportunity set, a concept that is uh, quite new relatively to those who are coming from just basic micro. So I'll see you in the next video where we discuss this. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next video. Thank you.